So this is a word now from our sponsor, one of our major sponsors, the uh, Contra Costa Water District. And uh, the Contra Costa Water District's Lawn to Garden Rebate Program provides rebates to qualified customers in Central and East Contra Costa County to replace their existing water thirsty front lawns with native or other water wise landscaping. The rebate is a dollar per square foot, up to $1,000 for a single family residence and up to $20,000 for commercial, homeowner associations, industrial and institutional properties. The district also offers a fabulous landscape design assistance program to its customers. In this program, customers can receive a free two hour consultation from a professional landscape designer. And that designer will help you explore ideas and make recommendations on the layout, plants and other features that might work in your front yard. You can visit ccwater.com to find out more. Kelly Marshall, whose garden you're going to see next, is a garden designer and she is a participating designer in the Contra Costa Water District's Landscape Design Assistance Program. If you'd be interested in having Kelly consult with you about your own front garden plans, you can visit the Contra Costa Water District's Lawn to Garden Program on their website. If you have questions for Kelly, I'd like to remind you to type your questions into the chat box on Zoom or YouTube and we'll take as many questions of yours as we can today. We're going now to visit Kelly Marshall and Mike Widener's garden in Clayton. And this is Kelly's garden. It's the uh, front yard <laughs> before photo. And uh, Kelly has a quarter acre. Um, this And this is her front garden uh, a couple of years ago when I was out to visit on the garden tour. You can see she had her plant labels out. Um, Kelly is the owner of Kelly Marshall Garden Design. Uh, if you are not in the Contra Costa Water District service area, you can find her information on the Find a Designer section on the Garden Tours website. This is uh, Kelly's back garden uh, some years ago. And this is Kelly's uh, back garden in a previous iteration, but you can just see how beautiful it is, even if she has changed some of the plants out. Uh, Kelly's garden is not only beautiful, but 40 species of birds have been seen in the garden. This is a bluebird on a bluebird nest. And they have nested in her bluebird box. And here is a fledgling just coming out. To keep birds safe, the family cat is kept indoors. Quail forage for seeds and insects in this garden. Fox uh, have been seen in it and Pacific chorus frogs have been heard. These are checker spot butterflies have laid their eggs in Kelly's garden. Here's the caterpillars on her bee plant and the uh, emerging adults on the left. This monarch butterfly was uh, noshing on some milkweed in Kelly's garden. So uh, here's a photo of Kelly's garden. You can see that uh, the plants in this garden do well in Clayton's hot, dry summers. You can see the plant list for Kelly's garden under the View the 2021 Gardens on the tours website or by looking at today's agenda. So I will now stop sharing my screen and we'll go to Kelly Marshall and uh, say hello to Kelly. Hi, Kelly. Oh, how are you? Good. How are you? Good, thank you. So thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. So Kelly uh, and I have been longtime colleagues. We have sheet mulched many a yard together when we were running sheet mulching workshops. We have run drip irrigation workshops together. We have given many talks together and it's always a pleasure to work with you, Kelly. Thank you so much. I appreciate working with you as well. All right, so I understand today we'll be seeing your own a back garden in your meadow and you'll be talking about how to design a native plant meadow. So I have a couple of questions for you. So just to start us off with, so what's a meadow? Uh, to me, a meadow is a relatively flat area. Uh, the, the bones of it are made up with ornamental grasses or uh, in some cases running grasses, grasses that don't stay in a clump but seed or spread out by rhizome. And then a mixture of wildflowers, there can certainly be some perennials uh, that go down for the winter and come back up like milkweed and that sort of thing. Um, it's a little wilder than you would find probably in a normal garden border, a little more unkept, uh, kind of a free-for-all, a little bit chaotic, but uh, that's the intention of it. 
Okay, thank you. And then uh, tell me why, why do you like gardening with native plants? Well, you know, I've uh, on a whim, my first year in business, I volunteered uh, to be in uh, Judy Adler's garden in Walnut Creek. I saw a listing in the newspaper and they needed volunteers. I did it. And I just, I fell in love with natives in that garden. That's the first time I really had been around them in, in a garden. I learned them in my classes, but I hadn't seen them in the flesh. And so um, I began to sneak them into designs without really telling people I was putting them in the designs. And then I just decided, you know what? I'm going to tell everybody, I'm, I'm going to uh, get these in as many gardens as I can. And now, um, you know, having so many of them in my own garden, I get to see the wildlife that comes, the, oh my gosh, it's just, it, there's activity all day, every day. And that's really wonderful. It's just really nice to know that I'm putting something back that should have been here, you know, before my house got built. All right. Okay. Thank you. Well, without further ado, then let's go and see Kelly's uh, video on Garden uh, Meadow. Good morning, happy Sunday, and welcome to the Marshall Widener Garden in Clayton. This is our back meadow, uh, formerly lawn. Probably four or five years ago, we decided to turn it over to something besides just a regular old lawn. We had definitely used it as a lawn when our girls were smaller, but as they have grown up and become interested in other things, this lawn was not getting used by anybody or anything. So we decided four or five years ago to turn it into a meadow. Um, some of the things that we have to take into consideration here in Clayton is we do have rattlesnakes. So we wanted to plant densely because I like my own garden to be planted densely, but we still wanted to be able to see some space around the plants so that if we did have a snake in the garden, we could see it. Um, we've had a couple of big king snakes go through the back. We've actually never seen a rattler back here, but we've had one in the front yard a couple times now. Um, as you can see, I've got a dog, and so what I plant here needs to be fairly dog friendly. It needs to be able to take the brunt of a dog running through it, uh, both for the dog's sake and for the plant's sake. Um, we actually started the first round of this meadow with I just kind of picked out some things I liked without any thought to whether or not they were native, um, whether or not they would be here year round. I just picked some things I liked and planted it. Well, I got the chance last fall to replant it primarily because we had a gopher show up for the first time in 15 years and annihilate probably 90% of the plantings. So this time in the fall, I decided to put anything new in, in that would uh, be native for sure. And then I really wanted to focus on some pollinator friendly plants that would support bees, um, butterflies and their caterpillars and birds as well. Not all native plants support those creatures uh, with the same weight. So I wanted to definitely pick some things that were on the higher end of the list of things that support wildlife and habitat. Um, I wanted to make sure I had good bones this time. When I design a meadow, um, I, I think it's a lot like any other part of the garden. Um, good bones means that we have something happening year round. And in this case, uh, it's going to be the ornamental grasses that I've chosen. Those are here all the time. And so I can count on them 365 days of the year to look pretty much exactly the same. And that's the good part about good bones is that they always are there and they always look good. Let me show you a couple of the main grasses that I worked in here. And these are actually both new, newly planted last fall. In front of us here is Festuca siskiyou blue or blue fescue grass. Not all blue fescue grasses are native, but this one is. It's gonna end up being um, about the size it is now. It's about one foot tall and two foot wide. And that is what it looks like every single day of the year. It does seed around a little bit um, and it does tend to brown out in the center over time. And when it does that, I probably would just pull it because I'm sure I would have babies nearby that would pretty much do the same thing. The other main good bone grass that's in here is this green guy immediately to the right. And that is Calaria macrantha, or June grass. 
That's a small one, um, only about a foot and a half wide, and that's mostly because it's arching out a little bit. And it's about 18 inches tall as well. This one is here year round, so I can count on it too. So right now you can see that the garden is completely full of wildflowers. I've got poppies going crazy. I've got Clarkia going crazy. Um, you, you actually can't see my blue-eyed grass hasn't opened yet this morning, but soon those will be open and I'll have little blue blossoms all over the place. And so those are really fabulous in the spring and lots of seasonal interest in the spring. But come summer, those begin to decline and die down. And so I have to make sure that I have other things in here that give me good structure and good interest all of the other months of the year. Uh, right here in front of us, I have one of our smaller buckwheat varieties. I actually don't remember which one this is, but it's a little guy. Um, he's just starting to bloom. Buckwheats are notorious for being good host plants for many caterpillars uh, of butterflies. So he is going to start blooming here soon and he'll bloom on and off this summer and then the blooms will turn coppery this fall. But the reason I really have him here is because he's a very good caterpillar host plant. I also have things at the edges that are what I like to think of as anchors for the garden. So in the background there is um, one of our white blooming manzanitas. That's Arctostaphylus. I believe that one is white cloud. Uh, the tree was already there, so the tree stays. That is actually not native. Um, at the other far end over there, I have to the left a Santa Cruz buckwheat. It's new. I planted it in the fall again because it's such a good pollinator plant, but also because it's really one of my favorites. I have it in the front. It's more mature out there. It's blooming already. It's just, I love the shape of it and I love the size and the bloom is pretty when it comes. So that's Areogonum arborescens. And it's gonna be a good anchor here at the back. I wouldn't fill my whole meadow with it because it just doesn't seem natural to me. Um, you only need a couple of these, but I do like it. Uh, next to that is a version of verbena lilacina or lilac verbena. This one blooms a very faint purple as you can see. It's a good butterfly nectar plant and it uh, smells like jasmine. So I'm standing here now and I wish you could smell how fabulous it smells. Over at the other side of my garden in the far corner here behind this post I have the more common of native lilac verbenas and this one is just regular old lilac verbena, verbena lilacina. It also smells like jasmine, so it's pretty fabulous sitting here next to my porch. It is also a good butterfly nectar plant. Some of the other things that I have in here for seasonal interest, heavier in the spring, I have our foothill penstemon. That's penstemon heterophylla. This variety is called margarita bop. Good hummingbird plant, good bee plant. In front of it here is one of the mimulus varieties, monkey flower. <coughs> Both of these plants, as well as a couple of other things in my garden, but not in my meadow, are good hosts for the checker spot caterpillar, which it comes from the checker spot butterfly. Um, so last year in particular, I had a huge crop of caterpillars and they do eat the leaves and that's okay. That's what the plants are here for. But then I had, when they all, they cocooned all over the backyard, I had cocoons sticking off the side of my slider door and sticking off the stucco of my house. And then they all, um, hatched and I had wonderful checker spot butterflies floating all over the garden, which was pretty fantastic. So I'm looking for seasonal interest. I'm looking for good bones. One of the, the things that's different in a meadow than in perhaps another part of the garden is that I'm going to do it on a smaller palette. I don't need every plant known to man represented in this meadow. I want to have a small grouping of, you know, three or maybe four kinds of grasses, which to me give it the meadowy look. 
We'll talk about the wildflowers in a minute. And then the other pieces that go in here, the smaller things that I think are, you know, worth having, I want to only have a handful of varieties and I just want to repeat them, repeat them, repeat them. So some of the things um, that are in here that, one, one of the things that's in here that you can't see is our native milkweed. It's just emerging. Uh, it's just a mixture of stems right now out, out here in this middle section although it will start blooming a little later this summer. It is narrow leaf milkweed, which is the appropriate milkweed to have in my garden for where I'm located for monarchs. Uh, we don't wanna be planting uh, tropical milkweed because it stays green year round and it is not as good for monarchs. In fact, it can be detrimental to monarchs because it stays green year round. And showy milkweed is actually might be appropriate for your zip code in your locale, but in, it's not appropriate for my location. So I don't have that in this garden. I did, and I took it out um, many years ago. I also have in here Origeron glaucus, or what we call seaside daisy. I like this one because it stays small. It's flexible with watering and light, and it blooms almost year round. Many years ago when we had snow in the garden, this was popped up blooming right through the snow, so it really just doesn't care. It's flexible and great for, depending on what your conditions are, uh, many different conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. I think that when you're designing a meadow, you do have to think about the scale overall of the space. So this is not actually that big of a space. It wasn't a very big lawn when it was a lawn. So I tried to use some smaller varieties, daintier leaves, that sort of thing. I, I think that's appropriate for what I've done in here this time. We do have to talk about space denial. You've probably heard of zone denial. Zone denial is when you plant something and you know it really doesn't go in your zone. Space denial is when you put something in that really doesn't fit in the space. And that means then that you, be, you end up being frustrated with it. You try to hack it back to contain it within the space. And then finally you just pull it out because it's too frustrating. So avoid yourself, uh, avoid the trouble and avoid having to do that with the plant by just not planting things that really don't fit in the space. Uh, when I plant in a meadow, I weave the grasses through first and I will put those, you know, sometimes there are a couple together, sometimes there are groups. I try to make it look very natural. There's certainly no line of things. It, it definitely um, helps to set things out first and see how you're going to do the planting. I don't usually add in the wildflowers until later. And that is because I want my main plants to get established and it usually takes the first season or two for that to happen before I add in anything else. The poppies that are in this garden actually started way over there in my edible garden and they have migrated now all the way across to the other end of my yard. And even they're actually heading down into my side garden now. And so you're seeing the result of a couple of uh, nights of me doing thinning and trying to pull them back from many of the plants that I planted that I don't want to be engulfed with poppies. So that's the other reason I tend to hold off on recommending the seeding of wildflowers in until after other things are more permanent. Um, but when you're doing your planting and if you think you're going to add wildflowers, you definitely want to leave space so that there's space for the wildflowers to come up. So just like any other part of a garden, when I planned this garden, I have to take into account my light conditions. As you can see, I have a western redbud over here to the right. And that has ended up being, well, it's probably about 20 feet wide now. It casts a lot of shade towards the back side of the meadow here. So that's why I'm able to get things like monkey flower in at the edges, which is a morning sun, afternoon shade plant. Um, growing underneath that, I have Artemisia californica, which really doesn't care, sun or shade, it's fine. But I do need to be thoughtful of what the light patterns are here because there are a lot of native plants, particularly plants from the coast, that are happier with a bit of a break from our sun in the afternoon. 
And then the other thing I want to talk to you about is how I water this meadow. So here along the ground is my drip tubing. So I use what's called inline drip. Here are two lines together, which I think is helpful to see. So inline drip has the emitters built inside the tubing and they are spaced evenly in the tubing. This spacing on, on this one that I have is 12 inches. So every 12 inches, there's an emitter inside the tube. You can't see it, but if you feel along the line, you can actually feel a little bit of a bulge where the emitter is. And what happens is these emit achingly slow. So water drips from each point along the line uh, this is 0.9 gallons per hour, so I would have to run it 45 minutes or an hour to get a full one gallon or nearly one gallon rate applied to the soil from each place along the line. And I'm thinking long term here. Long term, I am going to have roots from these plants everywhere. In the short term, I may not. I'm going to have to do a little hand watering. Um, when I lay the lines on the soil, I lay them 12 to 15 inches apart, as you can see here, in roughly parallel lines where possible. If I'm on a slope, I lay them parallel to the slope. So once this garden is established, and it is established now, I run it probably once every seven to 10 days, depending on how hot we are. Um, if you're coming off a dry winter, as we certainly are now, I definitely had to start watering sooner this year. Um, here in the front, by the way, is my little Calamagrastis mendocino reedgrass, Calamagrastis foliosa, mendocino reedgrass. This is actually one of my other favorites for this garden. I have it in the front yard up there. It's in filtered shade, and I have some that are 10 years old now. These are some that I had in the meadow before. The gopher loved them and he ate all of them but one. And so I replanted them this fall, but I put them in in gopher baskets this time so he can't get them. Um, this grass is definitely shorter lived in the, sh in the full sun, but I think it's so fantastic that I don't care. So I will have it in here for three or four years and then when it's gone, it's gone. All right, so I showed you my lighting, my irrigation. We talked about spacing. We talked about space denial. I think one of the other things that I want to talk about here, and certainly when people have been in this garden on the tour, they ask me about the maintenance. So let's talk about the maintenance for a minute because that's a, you know, that's a reality that we have to address. I already told you um, twice already this spring, I have thinned the wildflowers so that I could actually see some of my structural plants that I wanted to see. Um, at the end of the uh, spring and into early summer, I'll actually be cutting back my blue-eyed grass, the Cisrinchium bellum, which, is not, which isn't open at the moment. The flowers open a little bit later in the day, but there's a ton of that in here, and it seeds around wherever it wants to go, like some of the other things in here. So I cut all those down to the ground. Uh, usually Memorial Day weekend is when I do that, and then they emerge again in the fall. Uh, let me see if I can find a patch of that just to show you what it looks like. Here we go. So <clears throat> this is our blue-eyed grass. As you can see, it looks like a clump of grass. The flowers are just starting to open. Here they come. Um, I get a lot of bang for my buck from this, so I don't mind the work that it takes to maintain this. And it seeds so prolifically in my garden that I pull it wherever I don't want it at this point. Um, that is true also of the milkweed that's in this garden. You can plant milkweed where you want to, but it's gonna go where it wants to. And so I've actually had it coming up in the gravel over near my bog this spring, and I pulled it as soon as I saw it. I wanna get it out of here before it turns into a bigger plant, and I wanna get it out of here before a monarch discovers it and lays her eggs on it. I'm um, speaking of milkweed. Let's talk about pests in the garden. I am a hands-off person when it comes to pests in my garden. If you have milkweed in your garden, you are for sure going to have aphids on your milkweed, the little oleander aphids. They come and they're golden. In fact, I do have a patch of milkweed over here that's already got aphids all over it. So here is my narrow leaf milkweed coming. And here are the aphids that are already here all over the stem. So I'm actually just gonna leave those alone. 
Ladybugs eat them, parasitic wasps eat them. They don't seem to do any damage to the plant long term. Uh, this plant dies completely to the ground in the winter, so I'm not too worried about the foliage being deformed because it's gonna all turn brown. I'm gonna cut it down in January and it's gonna start all over again. But I, I know that if I have milkweed, this is part of the deal. So I usually put milkweed in a garden away from a path where you don't have to walk against it. You don't have to brush against it because I know it's gonna be covered with those little aphids. That's part of the habitat. Aphids are part of the habitat. Ladybugs are part of the habitat, in addition to the monarch butterflies. So I am, you know, it's all the circle of life. Of good things come and they eat the bad things. So I, I don't do any chemicals. I don't do any intervention with the spray of the hose because anything that I would do to get rid of the aphids on the milkweed would certainly um, possibly remove the monarch eggs if I had them. And so I am just hands off, live and let live. I look the other way. You know, gardens are not perfect. When you see photos of perfect gardens in magazines and books, let me tell you, I've been on a garden location where someone was coming to photograph one of my gardens. There are many worker bees making that garden look absolutely pristine before the photographer gets there to take the shots. And so I want to remind you as gardeners that whatever happens in the garden is not always your fault. Plants don't always do what they're supposed to do. They're unreliable. You may plant 10 of something and nine of them might be fantastic and one of them might be a runt. That's okay. You may plant something that you're certain will do great and it doesn't do great. That's okay. Gardens change, they evolve, they are not the same from year to year and there is nothing wrong with that. That's part of the beauty of being a gardener and having a garden is letting the garden adjust and ebb and flow and be different than it was for you last year. That's okay. Um, it's not personal. Uh, if it bothers you too much, I would encourage you to just let it go. All right, so I think that is what I wanted to tell you about designing a meadow. And I thank you for joining me on this tour, and I certainly hope to see you in person next year. Kelly, thank you so much. That was fabulous. So Kelly also, you'd think she was a videographer, but she is not. She is a garden designer, but she did a great job there. We're going to take a couple of quick questions, Kelly, before we move on. So uh, what if the gophers come back? Oh, he's still here. Okay. Um, still have our live trap out, have never caught him. We've moved it all over the garden. So everything new, including all my vegetables, went into the ground in gopher baskets this year. Um, my understanding is that not only is it really hard to get rid of them, but they're territorial. So once you actually eliminate one, another one just moves. They're, they're like gangs. They just, they just <laughs> you get a new gang member when you get rid of the old gang member. So um, I'm living and let living with gopher basket. Okay. Somebody asked, how long did it take for your red bud to get to its current size? It has been full size. Uh, let's see. It's been in the ground probably 15 years, and I brought it as a 24-inch box standard single trunk form. Um, it was probably full size after about five years. And, you know, big no-no. I planted it in the middle of the summer. That's a big no-no, but we, that's, when it, that's when we were ready to plant it, and we did it. It dropped every leaf. I was terrified that I'd killed it because I shouldn't have planted it in the middle of the summer. And then it sprouted out all new leaves. Okay, so it is... How tall is it now after 15 years? It is up to my roof and it easily spans the whole 20 foot uh, wall that it's against. Okay, so again, so if you want a uh, quick growing uh, cover, you don't, you don't really have to wait that long in the greater scheme of things. So Kelly, somebody pointed out that um, the plant list that we have on the website is not up to date with your new plants. So maybe you can send me an updated plant list and then I'll put it up on the website. Yes, I have an updated plant list actually. Okay, so let me say that, um, okay. so Kelly, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. All right, thanks for having right. me. Thank you. We're